Matt Botvinnik got a graduate degree in art history. And from there, he followed the obvious path, getting fully boarded in clinical psychiatry and becoming one of the leaded, leading bridges in brain science and artificial intelligence. Matt is the Director of Neuroscience Research at DeepMind. Before that, he was a Professor of Neuroscience at Princeton for 10 years. He would like to chat with all the brainiacs in this room about AI, cognitive psychology, and experimental neuroscience. Please welcome Matt Botvinnik. All right, um, so uh, let me just make sure we're working here. Yeah. So, so I'm really, I really like this idea of ecosystems for, uh, for neuroscience research. And it struck me that one thing that I might do, which might be useful for discussion, is just talk about the ecosystem that I'm inhabiting, which is sort of uh, unusual and I think sort of new uh, on the face of the earth in terms of the relationship that it involves between industry and neuroscience. Um, so I'm, I'm working at this company called DeepMind, which is based in London. Uh, I've been there for about three years. Um, the company uh, formed an affiliation with Google in, two, uh, in 2014. Um, and uh, the, the mission of the company is to solve artificial general intelligence. Uh, and we hope uh, make the world a better place. Um, and uh, let me just tell you a little bit about the, you know, the work that's been done there so far. And then I'll talk about the role of neuroscience. So um, the company made a, uh, its first big impact in 2015, right around the time I arrived, uh, with a nature paper describing work um, applying uh, AI systems that learn uh, to perform at superhuman levels on uh, classic Atari video games. That may sound like a kind of uh, silly thing to do, um, but it had a seismic impact in the AI world, as just indicated here by the number of citations that the relevant paper generated. Um, and that's not because people were obsessed with Atari, it's because of the underlying tech. So this was, um, this involved something called uh, and still called uh, deep reinforcement learning. The basic idea here is to take two uh, computational ingredients and make them work well together. The first is deep learning, or uh, what we used to call artificial neural networks. Um, and these are great, as uh, many of you will be familiar with, uh, for representation learning, uh, taking data and developing rich representations of that data to support decision making. But then combining that with reinforcement learning, which is essentially learning from uh, evaluative feedback. So instead of providing a teaching signal that said, do this now, do this specific thing now, instead all these learning systems get is a signal saying uh, how good their last action was. So it's like learning from reward and punishment rather from an explicit teacher, which is magic because then the learning system can figure out solutions that you never thought of. Um, and that's exactly what happened in the subsequent work done at DeepMind on uh, the classic board game of Go and then following that chess, uh, where deep reinforcement learning was used to reach uh, astronomically superhuman levels of performance. And this, again, had a, a really dramatic impact in the AI world and actually also in the Go world. This is a, a picture of a, um, a, a press conference in Korea where AlphaGo played against um, the world's leading uh, Go champion. Um, if you're interested in this, by the way, I really recommend this documentary that was made about AlphaGo. Uh, no conflict of interest here. It wasn't made by my company. It was independent, but it's really a beautiful consideration of not only the tech, but also the sort of social implications of it. Um, so the company's gone on to build on this framework, scaling deep reinforcement learning and applying it to broader domains. So for exa example, uh, there was a subsequent paper in Nature using a more structurally complex architecture to do things like question answering. Um, and we have recent work in which uh, multi-agent RL is used um, to um, develop agents that can play capture the flag um, in, uh, in different environments. And the important thing to note from this video is that's actually the input the agents are getting. It's not some sort of low-level symbolic inputs. It's actual video pixel-level input, and they just learn the strategies that are needed to play the game. Um, of course, lots of other stuff going on. Uh, recent developments include um, advances in voice synthesis. If you use Google Maps or Google Home, the voice you're hearing is based on DeepMind Tech. Um, stuff I'm really excited about um, involves object identification in computer vision, um, scene imagination, looking at a scene from different views and then imagining what it would look like from yet another view, uh, and um, increasingly science uh, applications, um, including recent work on protein folding that um, you may have heard about. So my title mentioned neuroscience, and I haven't mentioned that yet, so let me bring it in. Uh, I lead a group at DeepMind that's called the neuroscience team. And, um, it's a bit of a misnomer in one sense, uh, because most of what we do is uh, pretty, pretty straightforward uh, AI research. 
Although most of the people on the team have some background in neuroscience and psychology, and they bring that background to bear in various ways. However, having said that, we also are engaged in actual neuroscience research. So uh, just a first example of this, we had a paper in Neuron last year reporting uh, high resolution uh, MRI um, uh, data that uh, provided evidence for a particular computational theory of how the medial temporal lobe does um, pattern completion in memory. Um, why are we doing neuroscience research? Well, the reason um, is pretty much the same as the one that, for example, Gabriel articulated, which is that we think that there can be a synergistic relationship between neuroscience and AI, a, a kind of virtuous circle. Um, and we went on record with this, uh, you know, with this commitment shortly after I joined the company in a paper in Neuron where we just laid out our perspective on the potential relationship between uh, AI and neuroscience and the nature of this virtuous circle. And also uh, kind of a review of how that virtuous circle has um, benefited both fields in the past. It's actually um, really not hard to tell that story. If you look at this limb of the loop from neuroscience to AI, um, uh, almost everything that we're doing now um, that I've described so far really grew originally out of neuroscience and psychology research. So if you look at deep reinforcement learning and the ingredients that went into it, you can track almost all of them back to papers from the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, where the basic ideas, including convolutional neural networks and reinforcement learning, um, were um, inspired by, directly by considerations of how the brain might work. Um, that this is also true of the more recent work coming out of DeepMind. So one of the key ingredients that got deep reinforcement learning to finally work, people have been trying to get it to work for a long time, uh, but one of the magic ingredients that really got it to, to um, uh, fall into place was memory replay. And of course, that's a phenomenon that we know um, from uh, neuroscience, including work that's been um, famously done here at MIT. So, um, so, yeah, we really believe in this, uh, in this virtuous circle and we're pursuing it vigorously. Um, what about this uh, other side of the story from AI to neuroscience? Um, well, that's an easy story to tell, too, from the historical perspective. If you um, know anything about current theories of dopamine function, you'll know that they're very heavily informed by the computational theory of reinforcement learning. And of course, there's a very large literature looking using artificial neural networks of an AI uh, style to, un to try to understand the individual response properties of biological neurons. Um, and this, is, this literature has actually been reinvigorated lately because of the kind of resurgence of deep learning. We're trying to contribute to this literature ourselves, so we had a paper in uh, Nature last year looking at how recurrent neural networks trained in interesting environments can give rise to grid cells um, that look very much like those that support navigation in uh, mammalian brains. Uh, we had a paper in Nature Neuroscience using recurrent, net, uh, recurrent neural networks to um, examine some possibilities for how the interaction between dopaminergic learning and prefrontal function might give rise to meta-learning, um, learning to learn. Uh, and, um, and we've got a growing network of um, collaborators outside the company um, with whom we're trying to think about how to leverage new uh, perspectives in neuroscience um, to kind of turn this wheel um, that I'm talking about a little faster. Um, so but here's the thing. So I, in the work that I've done so far, I found it really easy to go from AI to neuroscience. That's just an easy thing to do, and I think we're making progress on it. Um, what I really want to do more of is take ideas from neuroscience and bring them into AI. That's kind of my job, um, and we're doing some of that, but I've found that it's harder than I thought it would be. Um, I feel like we're facing some headwinds. And um, so in, in, as a closing part of this presentation, I'd like to talk about why I think that is. And I think the answer is that the questions that we really need answered if we're going to follow this arrow from neuroscience to AI, not many people are actually working on them. Um, so what are those problems? They, these are really like, from an AI perspective, these are the holy grail problems um, in neuroscience. And ironically, uh, they can be put into two categories that um, many of you will recognize have been holy grail questions in neuroscience for a long, long time. And in a way, it's a little bit embarrassing that we haven't cracked them yet. So we can put them under these two headings, the binding problem and the credit assignment problem. What are those? In fact, one of these terms was uh, the credit assignment problem was coined by Marvin Minsky, who was in the 60s, who was mentioned earlier. Um, so the binding problem. Basically, this is about how the brain might support structured representations. We can start really simple here. So imagine you're looking at a scene that involves a red square and a blue circle. How does your brain represent the fact that the redness goes with the squareness and the blueness goes with the circleness, so that you don't mistakenly think that there's a red circle in your field of view? Um, 
This is about what's usually called feature binding, but we can take the same issue of structured representation and, and um, pursue it up a hierarchy of richness. So um, what about relations among features and entities? How is it that you represent these two rooms as very importantly different, even though they both involve the same chairs, the same tables, and um, essentially all of the same elements? Um, growing from there, we can ask, what about structured compositional representations, including causal models, of the kind that you might be leveraging if you're thinking about the players on your Little League baseball team and their respective positions, or um, trying to understand how an electrical circuit might function, or looking at, or thinking about the logic of a, of a recipe that you're, about to, um, that you're about to follow in the, in the kitchen. And from there, we can follow this even higher to variable, things like variable binding, or role filler pairing, or program-like representations, um, the kinds of things that computers do and that humans can do in a simpler way, but a very important way. So that's the binding problem. What about the credit assignment problem? It's very closely related, but also importantly different. The basic problem that this refers to is, what should we learn, or what should we infer from the things that we experience? So um, again, we can start really simple and ask, what, how, should how should synapses change in our brains when we have an experience? Um, this is um, one reason that people want to understand how backpropagation, the learning algorithm that's used in our AI systems, might play out in the brain, because it's all about that. It takes experience and maps it into particular local changes in synaptic weights. But this isn't just about synapses. So there are many simple animal learning paradigms that are very much about the animal has this series of experiences and then is probed with some new experience, what inference should the animal make? This is based on knowledge structures. This is based on, uh, this is based on knowledge. Um, and it's not just animal learning experiments. Uh, the other day, I plugged something in in my house and the lights went out, and I found myself immediately making inferences. Oh, I shouldn't plug the refrigerator in uh, on the same power outlet where I have my microwave. It's too much, too much current. That's knowledge-based structured inference. We need to figure out how the brain does this. Um, this is the kind of thing that supports generalization and transfer. So if I'm bitten by a cockatoo, and then I'm, I interact with, uh, uh, with a, a different kind of bird, Am I afraid of, that? how do I generalize that, what inference do I make about the danger of that situation? And would I make the same inference if I were in a situation where I was interacting with a dolphin? Probably not. I'm using, I'm using a credit assignment, knowledge-based credit assignment to make these inferences. Um, and then finally, one problem that's really fundamental in AI right now, and we really have to understand how the brain does this, is something called temporal credit assignment. I perform an action, there's a very delayed outcome, how do I look at the outcome and then go back and update my representation of how good that initial action was, spanning that intervening time interval? Um, good, so that's the point of view um, that I have for my uh, ecosystem, and I look forward to talking with people about how it might uh, interact with the one we're talking about building here. Thanks. <laughs>